welcome everyone uh, and we uh, dr purvish parekh and myself we welcome you all to the second chapter of uh, oncology beyond the obvious as the name suggest uh, we are going to discuss one topic each time during each of these episode we select one particular paper which can be practice changing or which may be practice changing from tomorrow uh, we discuss what is beyond the published literature we discuss what is applicable to us in day to day practice and try to answer some of the resolved unresolved questions uh, last time we had discussed olympia trial that is the adjuvant olaparib in braca positive breast cancer today we are going to discuss one more interesting topic and for that i invite uh, my mentor my professor my sir uh, dr purvesh parik sir uh, to discuss what are we going to discuss today and take the chapter beyond uh, sir right uh, thank you very much amish uh, as as has been done the last time i'll start with a little background so that all of us are on the right page so if you look at uh, a recent publication in south asian journal of cancer about newly diagnosed multiple myeloma from a single center in north india out of 378 they found 193 patients as eligible for autologous transplant but actually the transplant could be done only in 52 out of these patients so only 16 of the our patients actually get a transplant fortunately the transplant related mortality was zero which is very impressive and the average cost that they said was 7.2 lakhs if can you make it full screen please sorry i will i will i will i will is that better perfect sir perfect yeah yeah, yeah. and this is what they showed as the survival graph the pro mean progression free survival at 5 years was 75.3% and the mean overall survival at 5 years was 84.2% so this is the background of multiple myeloma in our country now forte trial talks about high risk cytogenetics so i pulled up this publication uh, last year from manipal hospital kasturba medical college and it says that high risk cytogenetics uh, occurs in about 20% or less of our patients okay so this is the background of multiple myeloma in the indian context now let's look at this forte trial which has two randomization first and second randomization and very interestingly as amish pointed out we are looking at fine uh, you know uh, looking at the final points in a publication this uh, uh, trial has been presented three times 2019 asco uh, then ash and now uh, this year in asco but the full text article has not yet been published so that makes it even more interesting to understand the final points of this particular trial So this forte trial is efficacy of calfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, that is KRD, with or without transplantation in newly diagnosed myeloma, according to the risk table. So this was published in 2019, and 474 patients of less than 65 years were included. So this is a large number, but they were randomized into three arms: um, control arm. as you can see is 4 4 4 then study arm also uh, four cycles of therapy plus autologous stem cell transplant and four cycles of therapy and then the study arm which they had uh, study arm c which did not have an autologous transplant and it had continuous 12 cycles of chemotherapy this was the first randomization and the outcome was decided based on the international staging system risk factors and this is the sort of Uh, uh diagram for the uh, open label phase 2 study arm a 159 patients arm b 158 patients arm c 157 patients and you can see arm a and b had autologous transplant whereas arm c did not have so the end point was pre maintenance very good partial remission stable com uh, complete remission mrd negativity safety and rate of early relapse now this is the revised multiple myeloma international staging system for it to be iss3 you have to have a serum beta 2 microglobulin of more than 5.4 and any one of the two that is by i fish the cytogenetic should be high risk 
or the LDH should be upper limit of normal. In the first column, which is in green, it is uh, ISS score 1. And if it does not fit into 1 or 3, then it is ISS score 2. Now, if you look at the MDR negative in the ESCO 2019 presentation, which was for data of the first randomization, if you look at ISS 1, the study arm has a 69% incidence of MDR negative actually, as opposed to 62%. And in the ISS 2, 3, it was 51% versus 47%. Now, if you, early relapse was considered as an important factor. And the, there was a significant difference in early relapse for all patients, 8% uh, versus 17%. And early relapse in ISS stage 2 and 3, which was 12% versus 23%. So this was the highlight of the 2019 presentation. Then the data was presented at ASH, and these are the survival girls. Unfortunately, they are only progression-free survival and not overall survival. The control arm is shown in blue in both the sides. And the study arm, you can clearly see, is giving a additional benefit. And if you look at the forest plot, for the overall group, it does not cross unity, and therefore, it is supposed to be the... Uh, study arm of randomization 1 as well as 2 are supposed to be statistically better. Now, let us move on to the presentation in 2021 at ASCO. And this was the value of the maintenance therapy of one drug versus two drugs according to the cytogenetic risk status. Now, for us to understand that, let us clearly understand and recap that high risk is translocation 414 translocation 14, 16, and deletion 17. Whereas everything else is standard risk. And I must uh, reiterate here that amplification 1Q was considered standard risk early. Now let us concentrate on the second part of the randomization. And that is uh, maintenance therapy of R versus KR. Now, specifically because the results are that AMP1Q is supposed to be non-responders, I have uh, ca categorized the FISH status on high-risk patients all, as well as AMP1Q. And you can see that across the three arms, it was comparable. So also for the maintenance arm, the two arms, again, it was comparable. In fact, if you look at the AMP1Q, it was higher in the uh, study arm as opposed to the control. So in this 2021 ASCO presentation, the investigators concluded this, that the study arm was better than the control arm for standard risk for multiple myeloma, 82 versus 67 percent, for high risk multiple myeloma, 62 percent versus 45 percent, and double hit multiple myeloma, 55 percent versus 32. And the last line is important, the benefit of KRD autologous stem cell transplant versus KRD-12 and KR versus R were observed in all cytogenetic groups except amplification 1Q. And this was quite intriguing. So with this, I uh, end the background presentation of the data that is available in the absence of a full presentation. And I will introduce Dr. M.B. Agarwal and move forward with his interview. Uh, welcome, everybody. Today, it is my proud privilege to have with us uh, Dr. Mohan Agarwal, uh, world-renowned international hematologist. And uh, we are going to discuss multiple myeloma. But before that, I would also like to share that um, Professor Agarwal, uh, I have the privilege of knowing him since 1980, when I was registrar and he was lecturer at KM Hospital. And since then, uh, it has been such a pleasure to see how he has excelled uh, not only in patient management, but also in terms of teaching and his uh, series uh, of annual series on hematology as well as his work with Mumbai Hematology Group is legendary. So, uh, sir, it's a pro honor and privilege for us that you are here. And we uh, definitely want to know your opinion about a very important topic, and that is multiple myeloma. So, uh, may I start with the first question? For newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients, is proteasome inhibitor based induction and consolidation 
followed by melphalan and autologous stem cell transplant the standard of care today and if it is standard of care in how many patients are we able to use so there is no denial that proteasome inhibitor are a essential part of uh, treatment of myeloma that has been duly diagnosed virtually worldwide all over uh, irrespective of uh, any problem it's only rarely that you avoid a proteasome inhibitor if the patient has a pre existing condition where you think that he will not be able to tolerate it like severe peripheral neuropathy right. or after starting a dose or two there is a problem of severe diarrhea or some intolerance otherwise right. yes proteasome inhibitor is a part and parcel of it excellent so unless otherwise specifically contraindicated it is the standard of care so with this strategy are we treating the patient with curative intent or palliative cure in myeloma is a uh, sort of hypothetical phenomenon the wishful thinking uh, we do have all of us who we all have patients who have not relapsed after 10 15 years and are either on just maintenance therapy or on nothing yeah. it remains a dream at the moment so majority of the patients we consider that they are going to relapse and they are going to have a second or fourth line of treatment so is it different from cml where we can act, have a functional cure and patient will be on lifelong therapy yeah so what you achieved in chronic myeloid and chronic pain is 50% of patients overall I mean, yeah the numbers can be very small but 50% of patients can be in tfr the treatment free remission all right that is i i think it's that there is a dream here yes absolutely small number of low risk patients of myeloma uh, 10% 15% who probably are off treatment and have not relapsed for decades so that is a fact of life and uh, under those circumstances what do you think is the overall survival in the real world for a newly diagnosed patient with multiple myeloma so median survival we have reached somewhere between 5 to 10 years so say 7 to 8 years all right so that is fairly good and this is good quality of life for those 7 8 years i would say so though the treatment toxicity can be there but most hmm. of the time patients are quite comfortable because you are going to make adjustments all right so knowing that patients are going to relapse following autologous uh, stem cell transplant uh, maintenance therapy is used with linalidomide using that as maintenance does it actually improve overall survival so okay in a transplant eligible patient lenalidomide has been clearly shown to improve the overall survival yes the data for transplant ineligible is uh, not there all right 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 so clearly at the beginning we have to decide whether the patient is going to be transplant eligible or ineligible and only then uh, start the treatment plan Uh, from the angle of maintenance yeah. yeah so even in transplant ineligible the maintenance therapy is given because it definitely adds to the progression free cycle right right so maintenance therapy is an essential component so i stand corrected maintenance therapy must be given to all patients of myeloma whether they are transplant eligible or not and those who are transplant eligible will probably have a overall survival benefit which the other group may not have yes. right perfect so what cytogenetic or molecular prognostic and predictive factors do you take into consideration when deciding the treatment plan for a newly diagnosed patient of multiple myeloma right so fish based cytogenetic analysis is sort of standard of care right so you are looking at uh, deletion 17p you are looking at translocations like 414 14 16 14 20 and in most of the centers now they are also looking at uh, gain of copy number 1q or loss right. of uh, 1p so uh, chromosomal conventional cytogenetics is practiced but most of the centers either are not able to culture or uh, they don't pay much attention to it and it mm-hmm. is passed out somewhere in front of the fish All right All right the fish definitely is uh, used and it can divide the patients into three groups right standard risk high risk and double hit patients yeah sure i mean the rss the revised uh, 
uh, international staging system uh, today includes the genetic and LDH as an important part of uh, risk stratification. Yeah. And then, yes, these terms are there, high risk, ultra high risk or double hit, uh, just like lymphoma. So if you have right. one cytogenetic abnormality, you are high risk. If you have got two or more, then you have double hit or whatever you call it, ultra high risk. Right, right. And out of these uh, specific fish uh, abnormalities that you have mentioned, is one more important than the other or all are of equal importance? No, no, definitely. First of all, some are common, some are uncommon. Mm. Now, deletion 17P is bad. And now if you have what is called, you know, four copies or more of uh, gain of uh, 1Q. Yes. And that also is a bad prognostic feature. So 414 is relatively better, but deletion 17P and um, gain of four copies of uh, 1Q are the worst. So this is as far as prognosis is concerned. But would you take them into consideration uh, as a predictive marker to decide what treatment to give to what patient? Yeah, so today a high risk myeloma or a double hit uh, myeloma is a unmet need. Hmm. One is not very sure what exactly to do with them. Right. Uh, many attempts have been done to improve the outcome of this group of patients, but lot of it has been unsuccessful. So people have tried to push in everything that is possible to treat this. We use uh, better PI, uh, better IMAID, use monoclonal antibodies. Uh, you go from triplet to quadruplet. Uh, you go for, from single transplant to tandem transplant. Right. So instead of just going straight to maintenance, you have extensive consolidation right up to one year. And then you give two drugs, maintenance. Uh, <laughs> now, sooner or later, people are talking about biospecifics and CAR-T coming up front, and the trials have already started to use them up front and see what happens. Right, right. But so far, we have to accept that the gains have been small. So, in your practice, in the real world, do you think that we should, you know, bombard them with more combinations up front, or we should use them in sequence? Uh, which is better from the patient's point of view? The most difficult question to answer. So uh, triplet is the standard of care. Uh -huh. And uh, when you, the moment you talk about anything more than that, it comes to either using carfilzomib up front yes. or adding uh, daratumumab. Right. Uh, practically, that's not the standard of care. Practically, that's expensive. Uh, it's not something which can be used worldwide, but if you want to do something for the patients who have a high risk or a, a ultra high risk myeloma, right. all that you can probably practice is to, as I just mentioned, you know, you replace, right. uh, or, uh, you replace Velcade with Carpizomib, add Daratumumab, do four cycles, do transplant, look for MRD, do not achieve MRD, do tandem transplant, and then maybe continue four drugs for consolidation for another few months and then give double uh, drug maintenance. All that you can do right. from it is this much. Gains are modest. Right, right, right. So that is a big challenge. It's so in December 2020 at ASH, Francesca Gay and Mario Boccadoro from the GMMA group present their data, their data, right? And this was, as you mentioned, on carfilzomib uh, plus linadolomide and dexamethasone. Do you think that carfilzomib is better combined with lenalidomide and dexamethasone or with cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone? Okay, so this study is a very nice study. Uh, yes. It was conceptualized in uh, 2014. Hmm. And it is three-arm study to begin with. And what they showed in those three arms is first, lenalidomide is superior to alkylating agent like cyclophosphamide. All right. So that puts an end to an alkylating agent as the first line treatment. So, e e e just one second. Yeah, sure. In spite of that, why are the Europeans still uh, favoring uh, cyclophosphamide? Not really. What happened okay. in enalidomide was not approved for a long time for the first I treatment see. in Europe. So, if you look at their problem, it was more of logistics, but the drug was not approved. Right. All the trials that came from Europe were with alkylating agents. 
and double tandem transports. Right, right. And the Europe moved to lenalidomide approval very, very early days. So they gave up tandem transplant, they gave up alkylating agent. But it's clear that use of alkylating agent uh, leads to a lot of uh, drug resistance and mutation. So it's a bad policy to use uh, alkylating agent software. Right. This particular study, what we are talking about, uh, Forte study, they showed clearly that uh, I mean is superior to cyclophosphamide. So that was one part of the trial. The second part of the trial they showed is that transplant is still indispensable. Mm. They used carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone 12 cycles versus four cycles followed by transplant, followed by four cycles. The results were superior uh, when transplant was used. So that was the first part of the study. Correct. The second randomization afterwards was maintenance, len versus len plus carfilzomib. Now there, if you remember last year, uh, Shaji presented in transplant ineligible patient data of uh, Velcade versus Carpels on it. Yeah. Standard is they showed that there is no advantage whatsoever putting a death nail to Carpels on it. Now, once again over here, in standard risk patients, though there is an advantage, but that is from the angle of progression free survival. Correct. Right. moment you talk about the high risk and ultra high risk, uh, that was presented this time, in, not last year. They yeah. really showed that uh, use of Carpels on it lenalidomide, dexamethasone, followed by transplant and the same maintenance has a huge advantage in this high-risk group of patients, followed by double maintenance, carfilzomib and lenalidomide. So, so that, uh, I, are, uh, I, I must say that uh, I don't think this is going to immediately come down to standard risk patients. What we said in the beginning, yes. Velcade remains the standard of care. Carfilzomib is a drip, 30 minutes, three injections in a month, and then you give that for the whole year. And we are talking about this in the maintenance phase. We're talking about two again drips every month versus welcare, which is given subcutaneously. Yes. Which can be done near home or at home. So there are a lot of uh, logistic problems once again. Correct. And if you use up carpels on it upfront, uh, again, what you said, sequential versus using everything upfront, you will end up only with daratumumab in the relapsed patients. Mm. Today, when you use Velcade, Len, and uh, steroid upfront, you got Carfilzomib, Palm, and steroid as the first relapse regime, which is affordable by a country like India. And then you can probably go to Daratumumab in the next relapse. Right. You use Carfilzomib upfront like the Forte trial, uh, you only left with Darat. Oh, very true. You, you mentioned about the uh, availability of data on progression-free survival, but not on overall survival as of now. Is that something that worries you or you are happy to uh, uh, start using it in patients on PFS? Not really. You know, progression-free survival is not probably very satisfactory because that can be achieved. If it is not going to add to the overall survival, then the difficulty which I mentioned with just now mm. are very glaring. Uh, you can use the quadruplet therapy with Dara front, and you can see wonderful extension of progression free survival. But does it add to the overall survival will remain an important issue. And that may take a decade to be sorted out. And therefore, people are looking at MRD because achievement of MRD probably may reflect ultimately in overall survival. And that is there. That you, the more aggressive you are up front, either because of quadruplet or because of carfilzomib, you are achieving a MRD negativity. And right. this MRD negativity can be made to last longer when you're using double agent maintenance therapy. So there is a glimpse of hope that yes, you may be adding to overall survival, but data doesn't exist at all. Right, right. Perfect. So as you mentioned, as for 2021, just last month, the Forte subset analysis was presented. What do you think is the new from this subset analysis that should be interesting to us? So this subset analysis was basically to talk about how to handle the high risk myeloma. All right. And there is distinct advantage shown in almost all cytogenetically defined high risk patients using carfilzomib based upfront treatment using the transplant and then carfilzomib based consolidation and carfilzomib based uh, maintenance therapy that yes, you are achieving uh, a increased progression free survival to the extent that except uh, the uh, 
you know, four copies of uh, one Q, except yeah. that particular group, where there was no advantage, rest, all the cytogenetic features were taken care of. Right. And uh, a high risk myeloma behaved almost like a standard risk, as far as right. the results are concerned. In fact, what they showed was that for standard risk, high risk, as well as double risk, the study arm was better in numerically. Standard risk it was 82 percent versus 67 uh, percent. In high risk it was 62 percent versus 45 percent, and in double hip it was 55 percent versus 35 percent. And this is four-year progression free survival. Sure. So that was quite impressive. But you really pointed out that amplification one Q was a subset which did not benefit. Any thoughts on why this particular subset is having problem? So, you know, as in the beginning, you asked whether all the cytogenetic features have the same kind of uh, implication. Yes. There have been no dedicated studies looking at the cytogenetic subtypes. These right. are the subgroup analysis of any large trial. Mm. So number of patients who have been uh, defined as high risk have small numbers in each. Correct. So, therefore, you have no data for, say, extramedullary myeloma, or you've got a plasma cell leukemia, or you've got a CNS myeloma. They all become very small group to be statistically standing the test of time. Uh, deletion 17p is inferior to translocation. All right. And uh, quadruple copies of gain of 1q is inferior to even that. It just goes to tell you that the bad prognostic cytogenetics all cannot be put into one box. All right. Each right. one has got its own uh, difference in outcome. So double hit may be the worst. And even with single hit, certain mutations are bad with compared to certain, like say, the deletion one thing. It's very modest impact on the outcome of the patient. Right, right. Some are good, some are not so good. Perfect, perfect. So, leaving aside forte trial, let's now discuss <clears throat> the real world situation about multiple myeloma in India. Are you satisfied with the number of centers that are offering autologous stem cell transplant in India today? So, so we have come a long way, isn't it? Almost yes. 80 to 90 centers right. being transplanted. And if a center is being transplanted, the easiest of the transplant they are doing is the myeloma autologous transplant. Very true. But there are a huge number of hematologists who are only doing autologous transplant for myeloma and nothing else. Right. They don't require storage. There is no graft versus host disease. There is no donor searching. Uh, patients are out of the hospital in uh, 8 to 12 days. Most of therapy is, uh, you know, it's one time treatment taking away a lot of other costs. So yes. 7 8 lakhs. And, uh, uh, it's, it's something that I would say widely available. Yes. It's the counseling of the patient that matters. Right. It has been counseled properly. Then those who are transplant eligible centers are available. Right. Most right. of the city, most of the state. Say Mumbai, there are 10 centers doing it. Delhi, there are 10 centers doing it. So it's there now all over. Perfect. So still there are lots of unmet needs as far as patients with multiple myeloma in India are concerned. Sure. Where should we focus on to address these problems? I mean, you can start right from early diagnosis, awareness, general physicians, orthopedic surgeon, nephrologist, neurologist. So many times you see the patients who have been moved from place to place and six months of symptomatology and then in electrophoresis is done. Yes. Forget bone marrow examination, forget PET scan and electrophoresis which is available next door which cost you 350 rupees is not ordered for. Correct. So you start right from that thing and then once you are diagnosed, you come to the treatment uh, you must have still notice cortisone is being used as a short intravenous infusion, which is a mockery of cortisone. Right. So subcutaneous route, which is so safe and equally effective, is not being practiced. Then comes the transplant eligibility assessment and doing the fish for all the patients. With the standalone labs, fish test is available to everybody. Hmm. You have to think the importance of fish and order it for everything. So Pet scan is not important. You should do Very true. Giving healthcare uh, properly, four months, and doing transplant as one time expense to all those who are transplant eligible is an important thing. And then, of course, the simple maintenance comes in. So there are loopholes in all these places late references, mm -hmm. late suspicion, not ordering for protein electrophoresis, not using well properly, 
not doing fish studies, not uh, counseling the patient for transplant and its advantage. Patients feel transplant means marge. I see. So this kind of autologous transplant and its benignness has to be pushed forward in the patient's mind. It requires counseling, it requires time, it requires multiple sitting, whether transplant is a deterrent in patient's mind, but then you can do it. And then proper maintenance, taking care of toxicities of the drugs, adjusting the drugs, schedule, doses. If one is toxic, another one, you've got again well-kid maintenance, lenalidomide maintenance, you can go for another drug also, but you've got options available to you. So right. first line of treatment has to be improved and made available to everybody. Over your 30 years of practice, has the presentation of a newly diagnosed patient of multiple myeloma changed, evolved? Are there any differences that you're seeing? Sure, you do get early references, but then, you know, sitting in Mumbai, you're talking about a very select group of references. True, true. But if you take the country as a whole, you still see patients being brought on stretcher with pathological fractures, patients having renal failure going on for ages. Hmm. You see patients who have been transplanted, renal transplant has been done, and then the transplanted kidney got myeloma and then yes. the kidney had myeloma that has been diagnosed. So late diagnosis has not changed. Right. The rest of the things remain the same. Yes, sure. You make an early diagnosis in cities, in centers. Right. Yeah. So uh, you have uh, discussed a lot of points. I would like to... Uh, Thank you. But before that, I would like you to give the final message to our hematologists and medical oncologists. So these are people who know multiple myeloma and who are familiar with what are the treatment options. As far as Forte trial is concerned, what is the message that you want to give to qualified people dealing with multiple myeloma? So I will just repeat in two sentences which we just discussed. One, forget alkylating agents up front. Very important. Use IMID. The only IMID to be used upfront has to be lenalidomide unless there is a reason to go for thalidomide. And of course, you should avoid formalidomide to keep it for the next step. All right. So that's about the IMIDs, the most important superiority over alkylating agent. Number two, transplant, transplant, transplant for all transplant eligible patients. In this country, one time expense is much, much, much better than spending lakhs and lakhs of rupees over the next two years. And third, all high-risk patients should be picked up early. They should be diagnosed by fish. So do fish from an authentic center for all patients. And high-risk patients, probably it's time to change over to carfilzomib induction, carfilzomib consolidation, carfilzomib based doublet as the moment. All right. Yeah, at the moment, I can only get this much message from protein. Perfect. And whatever you mentioned very briefly about CAR T cell therapy, and uh, there are other uh, similar agents as well. When do you think they will mature enough to be used for myeloma patients? So, you know, after transplant, the first breakthrough in transplant and monoclonal antibody, the first breakthrough is the other immunotherapies. All right. Use breakthrough. And you've got three groups of agents the ADCs, the bispecifics, and the CAR T. And of which I will forget the ADCs. Let's talk about only about the bispecifics and the CAR T. Yes. Bispecifics for India is very important because every hematologist and medical oncologist in nook and corner of the country can do it. So I would say that is something which you must champion as and when it becomes available to us. Because though it's not one time treatment like CAR T, but it has got a success rate which is equal to CAR T. Right. So that's about bispecific. CAR T is like transplant, one time, very effective, very powerful treatment. And very soon it may become the second line of treatment, like it's happening in lymphoma. All right. In BCL, first relapse, you have now started thinking of, not yet approved, but started thinking of CAR T. Same thing may happen to myeloma, first relapse. It's already happening to myeloma, second relapse. It will come into the high risk patients of myeloma. And CAR T using BCMA, of course, but even others, is wonderful. Again, like lymphoma, it's not a cure. Here, it's a long remission, but the median remission with the present protocols and present agents is almost a year plus. So half your patients are going beyond one year. And these PEMI patients who have been enrolled into third, fourth, fifth relapses. So CAR-T is here to stay. 
So those centers which ultimately will set up their parties, and that's going to happen in five years all over the country, they will be able to offer CAR-T, which will be a very powerful treatment. And small guys in small centers aim for the bi-specific, which will give you equal results. All right. So as uh, uh, CAR-T, uh, IIT Mumbai and uh, Tata Hospital have started the clinical trial and they are already enrolling patients. So we hope that it is locally available and therefore significantly cheaper than what is available elsewhere. True. So with that, uh, Dr. Mohan Agarwal, uh, I must thank you immensely for giving your wonderful 30, 35 years of uh, experience and insight into the current management of multiple myeloma with special uh, reference to Forte trial. And I'm sure that the uh, subsequent the panel discussion as well as the audience will Im benefit immensely from the interaction that we have had. Thank, Thank you very much. For the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is great. Uh, after the legendary interview, le interview with legendary MB Agarwal, sir, as per the format of our webinar, Oncology Beyond the Obvious, uh, now we have panel discussion for which uh, we invite one of our very, very well-respected teacher and researcher, Dr. Heman Malhotra, sir, who wears many hats and he's from Jaipur. Right now, he's Director Oncology Services, Sri Ram Cancer and Super Speciality Center and Professor and Head, Department of Medical Oncology, MGM College Hospital, uh, Jaipur. Uh, I invite uh, Heman Malhotra, sir, to moderate the session on further discussion in the Forte trial beyond which MP Agarwal sir has highlighted. And may I request Kashish and Kavina Creations to invite the panelists also. And Malhotra sir, if you can take some of the chat box questions during the panel discussion, that would be great. So, uh, thank you very much, Amish. And uh, Dr. Heman Malhotra is uh, no stranger to us. Uh, he has been professor and uh, was part of SMS Medical College and then he decided not to accept uh, more administrative responsibilities and focus on treating patients, which is a, like a passion for him. And now he has set up an entire new department at MG Hospital. So Dr. Eman Malhotra, sir, you can unmute yourself and start the panel. His panelists are Dr. Ajay Bafna, senior medical oncologist also from Jaipur. Dr. Bhavsai Bhagel from hematologist from Mumbai at Tata Memorial Hospital. Dr. Amit Upadhyay, hematologist from New Delhi. Dr. Ganesh Jaisatwar, hematologist from Hyderabad. Dr. Prabhat Singh Malik, medical oncologist from Delhi. And Dr. Ritu Jain, uh, medical oncologist from Mumbai. So we have a full representation from different parts of the country. They have tremendous experience in myeloma. And over to you, Heman. And thank you very much, Dr. Purvish. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, both are right. Oh, wonderful. So I'd like to, you know, first uh, uh, thank, for, thank uh, Dr. Amish and Dr. Parikh for this opportunity. And you can trust them to, you know, think of unique things and uh, initiate unique programs. So uh, very, very heartfelt thanks to both of you. And then again, I'd like to, you know, congratulate Dr. Parikh and Dr. Agarwal on a wonderful 30 minutes. Uh, and, you know, I might as well uh, uh, close shop and go and have dinner. All my questions have already been covered and answered by Dr. Agarwal. Uh, but, you know, let's try and, uh, you know, incorporate the experience of my very, very wonderful panel into how they would approach and how do they interpret the results of this voted trial. Uh, two things before I start. I think we have plenty of time, so let me waste one more minute of yours. The first is that today, uh, 31st of August 1991, I completed my training at Tata. And today, post uh, specialization, I'm completing 30 years in oncology. So just like to say thanks to all my teachers and my friends and my colleagues for this incredible experience and this incredible journey. I've learned each day from each one of you and I've learned uh, uh, from my patients and I'm really thankful to God for this opportunity of uh, learning from Tata. Uh, Dr. Advani, Dr. Banavli and Dr. Parikh are the three people who have been instrumental in shaping my, you know, uh, shaping my journey as an oncologist. And I've had the distinct pleasure of uh, 
starting oncology departments in two large institutions in Jaipur, uh, starting palliative care in two large institutions of Jaipur. So really thankful to God for all these opportunities. Uh, I've had an opportunity to interact and possibly, you know, influence a few of my colleagues to take up medical oncology, a whole bunch of students to take up, take up medical oncology. And it's been a fantastic journey. Thank you, everybody. Second thing which I'd like to do, which is not related to this panel discussion, is congratulate Dr. Pankaj Malhotra. I don't know how many of you know that he is now the uh, country's India's representative on the International Multiple Myeloma Board. And I think we'll ask Pankaj to elaborate on that when he starts his talk. So congratulations to you, Pankaj. We are very, very proud of you. So let's uh, welcome my panel, and we have an incredible panel as has been introduced to you. Uh, Dr. Pankaj is the expert, and I will use my prerogative as moderator to ask him some sticky questions also. Dr. Agarwal is hematologist par excellence, our teacher, and every time you meet him, talk to him, listen to him, you gain something, you learn something. Uh, Dr. Ajay Bhapra, my, my very dear friend from Jaipur, Dr. Bausab Bagel from KMH Mumbai, and Dr. Amit Upadhyay from Delhi, Dr. Ganesh from Hyderabad, Dr. Pankaj from uh, uh, Ames, Delhi, and Dr. Ritu from Mumbai. So this is my very, very enlightened panel. And uh, you know, Dr. Padik has already given you a snapshot of what we are going to discuss today. And you know, there's one peculiar thing which I have noticed that the Forte trial has been around since 1998. And we've been having presentations uh, of the study since 1998. The toxicities were reported in 1998, but we are still waiting for the publication. I don't know why they're taking so much time. Their accruals are now complete. And we really want to see the publication and you know look at the details which all of us are interested in. So this was uh, you know basically I'm going to ask you questions related to this uh, abstract which was presented in the Ash uh, uh, 2020, and this was a oral presentation at that Ash. And this was, as Dr. Parikh pointed out, uh, a presentation at PCR's ASCO, in which uh, there was analysis of efficacy in high-risk patients. So just to recap for you in, in a little more details, the aim of this analysis was to evaluate the PFS of KRD induction uh, and stem cell transplant, KRD consolidation. Uh, this is known as the KRD ASC arm versus 12 cycles of KRD versus KCD induction, transplant, and KCD consolidation. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a second randomization during maintenance, which has already been highlighted to you. Uh, and uh, this I will show you again. So uh, patients were less than 65 years of age, randomization of one is to one is to one to the uh, three arms, uh, stratification was by ISS and H. And, uh, you know, standard KRD was used uh, in the first cycle, lower dose of carfilzomib, and second cycle onwards, uh, 36 milligrams per meter square. Uh, the first two days of each of the two weeks, standard uh, uh, dose of lenalidomide and standard low dose dexamethasone. Cyclophosphamide, again, uh, standard dose, 300 milligrams per meter square, uh, day one of every week. And uh, the maintenance was to uh, carfilzomib uh, lenalidomide. Uh, initially, uh, was uh, every uh, uh, day one, day two, uh, and day 15, 16, but then it was changed because of toxicity and dose increase and convenience, uh, day one and day 15 of every month. And this was given for two years. And uh, uh, land maintenance was 10 milligrams per day, 21, three weeks on and one week off until progression. And MRD was done by eight color uh, fish, a sensitivity of 10 to power five. Uh, and the data cutoff was June 30, 2020. And we are you know looking forward for the publication now. So this was the this was the schema of the study. Uh, newly diagnosed patients with multiple myeloma, less than 65 years of age, one to one to one randomization between arm A, B, C. 
<coughs> stem cell collection at this point, uh, transplant for the two arms and continuation of TRD for four more cycles. And then uh, um, the first arm received uh, KRD as uh, consolidation therapy. And second randomization uh, to KRD versus R uh, during metrics. So my first question to the panel, I think you've already heard Dr. Agarwal. Let me ask Dr. Bau Saib. Bau Saib, uh, Bau Saib are, you, are you okay with the design of this trial? And if you were to design this trial today, as Dr. Agarwal told us, it was, it was you know, designed and put into motion by the Italian group in 2014. Uh, would, you, would you suggest something different uh, in this study? Dr. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. So I think uh, um, Agarwal sir rightly pointed out this, this was designed way back in 2013-14. And uh, mainly it was in European context where IMEDs were not allowed in the first line setting. But whatever be the reason, I think uh, the first uh, uh, issue with the design, which I think is the control arm or the comparator arm, because it should be uh, uh, a protozoam with lenalidomide and dexamethasone as an induction regimen. Uh, second issue which I feel with this is the uh, uh, the ambition of comparing a, a transplant approach to a non-transplant approach. I think that was a bit immature. Given the uh, early result of IFM DFCI study, at that time with the VRD backbone, the transplant was uh, uh, shown to be equivalent, but non-transplant arm was probably uh, would be inferior if you don't have a good uh, treatment regimen. So that was second issue. Third thing is the issue of uh, maintenance here, sir. I think uh, the lenadamide versus carfilzomib and lenadamide maintenance, this is kind of addressing a second question, but on the uh, previous to that, patient are receiving three different types of treatment. So probably that should have been addressed in a separate trial altogether, according to uh, me, uh, as far as the design issue goes, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prabhat, uh, if you were to design this trial today, in addition to the two or three points with uh, Dr. Bausa has mentioned, would you would you want to modify anything else if, uh, if the trial was to be designed today? Dr. Prabhat. So is, is Dr. Prabhat on board? Can the, the organizers confirm for me, please? He is not here. No, I can't see his name uh, as logged in. So can I pass on the question to Dr. Amit? Amit, uh, any any inputs from your side vis-a-vis -vis the design of this trial? Sir, I would agree with Dr. Babu Sahib that in Indian context, the comparative, rather than being KCD, it should have been BRD. We are much more using BRD upfront, and it makes sense for us to compare with whatever our practices for to look for the betterment of results. So I completely agree with that. So I actually agree with Dr. Bausab and Dr. Amit that uh, the world over, in fact, not only in India, world over the standard first line induction regime is uh, uh, VRD and the comparator arm uh, in this study, if it had been VRD, then you know it would really have answered the question whether a more powerful proteasome inhibitor used up front, and particularly in the high-risk myelomas, uh, does it make a difference, or is, are the results equivalent or similar to uh, uh, VRD? So, so if you could move on, this was the baseline characteristics of the patients at first randomization, uh, you know, mean age was pretty much well matched. About uh, one fifth of the patients in all the three arms were uh, ISS stage three, and uh, you know, bad chromosomal, uh, bad uh, high risk chromosomal abnormalities were about equally distributed in the three trials. The high risk, uh, as per Fish, uh, two thirds of the patients uh, in all the three arms uh, were uh, high risk, and about a quarter to a third uh, were double hits. And uh, 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 this was the randomization, and we, you know, kind of not read this, but move to the results. And here are the here are the forest plots for you. Uh, this is the forest plot comparing uh, KRD's transplant versus KCD transplant. And as Dr. Agarwal in his introduction very clearly pointed out, uh, this uh, gives us a very clear cut message that a proteasome inhibitor as induction is significantly superior to an alkylating agent as the induction. 
and this holds true across board whether the patient has uh, uh, stage one or stage three ISS disease, uh, whether uh, the patient has standard or high risk. And this is the first plot uh, comparing KRD transplant KRD versus 12 cycles of uh, KRD. And this again, you know, pretty clearly conveys to us, and I think this is the sixth or the seventh trial, uh, which uh, re-emphasizes this, that transplant, uh, as soon as the patient goes into CR, uh, is the way to go forward. It does add to a progression-free survival. And here are your PFS curves for you. The green one in the top one is the KRD transplant KRD, and the bottom one is KCD transplant KCD. So now my question to Dr. Ajay uh, is yes, that uh, uh, how do you respond to these results and what are the implications of these results for you? Uh, sir, the unprecedented results of the KRD followed by uh, autologous stem cell transplantation, uh, this trial tells us that it is one of the option, not the option. So the armamentarium has added one more option for the upfront treatment of the transplant eligible multiple myeloma newly diagnosed patient. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ganesh, uh, same question to you. Uh, what do the results uh, convey to you? Uh, sir, good evening. Uh, so as I echo the, the opinions uh, by my esteemed other co-colleagues in the panel. So uh, one uh, in, in the high-risk subset in particular across the study group, the most uh, uh, effective triplet followed by autologous transplant consolidation, uh, achieving the continued MRD negativity uh, at uh, 12 and 18 months is probably the one uh, which improves the uh, EFS uh, uh, across available uh, therapeutic regimens. So, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Bausab has nicely elaborated that their transplant subset would have been uh, uh, studied in a different uh, subset analysis. It would have been better. But then in the current uh, scenario, the, uh, the, uh, the best possible effective triplet uh, uh, induction as well as consolidation with a transplant and uh, maintenance probably achieves the best possible MRD negativity and long-term PFS. One important aspect here is, uh, as highlighted by this trial, the uh, the MRD negativity or the best possible response across the arms are almost uh, more or less same. But what is important in terms of long-term PFS is the role of transplant. So, uh, and that is more, very relevant to the high-risk subset. So, even though standard risk patients who are persistently MRD negativity, their PFS might not be as good as those high-risk patients achieving MRD negativity and maintaining MRD negativity post-transplant. So that's an important message here uh, uh, from this trial. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ritu, can I come to you now? Can I ask you, uh, like, what is your regime of choice uh, for induction uh, in a newly diagnosed fit patient of myeloma? Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Sir, uh, like uh, now as uh, in our clinical practice, uh, cytogenetic baseline fish at diagnosis we are doing, so depending on the high-risk cytogenetics, so far we are using a triplet. Even in the standard cytogenetics, we are using a bortezomib-based subcutaneous uh, bortezomib-based preparation with VRD and three to four cycles with uh, induction. And if they achieve a, a, PR, a complete response or a VGPR, not MRD, then we definitely take these patients for autologous transplant followed by maintenance. Only things are in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. If suppose before the carpalozumib, if it's a high-risk cytogenetics, uh, we would be following that Mayo Clinic, Dr. Shaji Kumar's protocol, like after uh, auto transplant, even if they were in a VGPR or a complete remission, we gave two means, we generally give bortezomib based two to three cycles of uh, uh, post transplant as maintenance and followed by a doublet maintenance, bortezomib maintenance. That is the way so far we have been treating. And only things are in four five of our high risk cytogenetic patients, even after transplant, they were like high risk cytogenetics, double and 17 Q deletion. Even after transplant, four five of them recently relapsed. So, this is a very difficult group of patients. And only thing in this trial, what I like that. Uh, in the third answer, where they have not uh, offered transplant, only the KRD has been continued. 
So I look at it this way that even in this high risk cytogenetics group, even if we are not offering transplant or uh, suppose ineligibility or in many other factors, there is some drug which shows benefit in this high risk uh, cytogenetic group. So you are at transplant center, Ritu. Uh, can you, you know, highlight for us uh, the reluctance on the part of oncologists and hematologists in referring their patients uh, who are eligible for transplant to a transplant center for transplant? As Dr. Parik already pointed out, less than 10% of all eligible patients of myeloma in our country are transplanted. So where is the block? Where is the hesitation? There, are, there is enough level one evidence that it adds to the PFS. It doesn't cure myeloma, but it significantly adds anything between uh, two to four years to the PFS. So why are why are people not referring uh, patients of myeloma for a transplant? So most of the factors which M.B. Agarwal sir enumerated, we also face in day to day clinical practice. First and foremost, I feel, sir, there is a lack of awareness. You mentioned the word transplant, and you know, and they feel there is some surgical procedure and all those things. So awareness is the most important thing. And sir, I agree with sir, and that also has been our experience. Average eight to nine lakhs of therapy, sir, two to three weeks of hospitalization, and and if and most of our patient at our center, we are taking them up front, sir. So mortality is not there. And you know, it's like even sometimes when they don't require any antibiotics. So if you ask as a transplant, that which uh, you know, which is the transplant we will do is myeloma because everybody is happy. So the first and foremost is the referral bias because the uh, treating doctors feel that it's a long procedure, it's not available, cost is involved, toxicity is involved, and mortality. That is, I think, the bottom line. Sir. And even patients are scared. Like right now, one of our neurologist own sisters are 58 years old, finished uh, three cycles VRD, standard risk cytogenetics. Counseled her for BMP. She's saying, let me think over. I will uh, you know, complete six cycles and then do it. So definitely that fear factor in the patient's mind, referral bias is there. Sir. So awareness, I think it's the key. Very, very well said, Ritu. I think uh, awareness uh, for the treating uh, clinicians and also awareness for the patient. So if it could come back to the trial, this is the this is the second randomization. And again, you can see the PFS curves very clearly favor uh, two drug uh, maintenance uh, versus uh, lenalidomide maintenance alone. And uh, this benefit is in this forest plot uh, across the board, whether the patient has early stage disease or more advanced disease, whether the patient has uh, standard uh, risk features or high risk features. So again, uh, Dr. Agarwal, uh, can I uh, trouble you with this question? Uh, is it, uh, is it uh, uh, convenient for the patient to, and you know, is, does this difference uh, justify, say, for the example, the the inconvenience of a twice a month injection uh, for the patient who has standard risk myeloma in the maintenance setting, or would you be happy with just uh, uh, oral len? Uh, standard maintenance therapy. Dr. Agarwal, there, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm to ask you this you question. Can you hear me? I'm speaking. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, sir. Please go ahead, sir. So standard of care in the maintenance is a single drug therapy for standard risk myeloma. And that is lenalidomide alone. Only the patients who cannot tolerate lenalidomide for some reason or the other that you go for bortezomib. All other older protocols are obsolete. Thalidomide, etc. are obsolete. Now, once you come to high risk, probably you go for the doublet and that is also most of the time Valkid plus lenalidomide, but this study tells you that at least adding a BI is important. And as was pointed out right in the beginning, we don't have a control arm containing Valkid. So you don't have an answer to that question. That is Carfilzomib superior to Valkid in the maintenance arm. There's no study like that existing in the exactly. world. So from this study, you can only take that yes, uh, KR is superior to R. But you have to also give importance to all that what has gone on before this maintenance. It is not just this maintenance. All that has gone on before the maintenance plus this. 
and uh, that's it. About 15-20 minutes drip of carfilzomib twice a month may not be a huge headache. Previously used to give six drips in the induction and consolidation, which got reduced to three during maintenance twice. So unless somebody shows that yes, Velcade is inferior to carfilzomib, this is all right. Very well said, sir. So if we could move on, uh, I think we've already discussed this. So uh, uh, let me ask Dr. Bausa. Bausa, with these results, uh, would you be tempted to uh, switch to two drug maintenance uh, in your high risk patients? Uh, I think, sir, uh, as uh, Agarwal, sir, pointed out, the practice of two double maintenance in high-risk patient is really not based on uh, good evidence. If we look at the older recommendation of treating high-risk myeloma, it was to treat with KRD as per the MS partner, and many people recommended without evidence. But now we know that it doesn't work. So uh, uh, we tend to use, I think, important message is high-risk people need to be treated with a novel induction, including PI and bortezomib. They need to be transplanted in CR1 and they need to be given prolonged treatment and possibly with uh, double maintenance. So that is best way. And then only you could cross a uh, uh, few um, 30, 40 months for this kind of people. So that is uh, my take on that, sir. So when you use land maintenance in these patients, uh, do you follow the standard three week on, one week off protocol or do you give 10 milligrams continuously or maybe five milligrams continuously? Uh, sir, so we usually uh, give the break 21 days and 7 days off and uh, doses vary from 10 or 15 milligrams. Sometimes we have to cut down also. But I, I think long term, uh, there are issues, neutropenia, skin rash, hyperpigmentation, this kind of things they come across. And uh, bortezomib also, we are usually not able to give beyond uh, maybe 18 months or 2 years. Again, neuropathy sets in. So, Hemant, I would like to get in here. Uh, there is no data on 5 mg of lenalidomide being given continuously. That will not be considered standard of care. And uh, yes, you get end up into neutropenia, etc. if you try 15 mg. So 10 mg is the standard. 21 days on and uh, one week off is the standard. And in high risk, there is no question of giving one drug maintenance. It is two drugs. The only unanswered question is whether Velcade is good enough or you have to have, uh, you have, to have carfilzomib. That is the only unanswered question. And even in this trial, the maintenance went on and on, but carfilzomib was only for two years. So you are not continuing PI for more than two years in any maintenance trial. Right, sir. Thank you very much for those inputs. So now we'll move to the, the uh, results of the four day uh, in high risk cytogenetics patients presented at uh, this year's ASCO. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know the background, so we, you know, kind of move this. I mean, baseline characteristics uh, we've already shown you. And this is what I'd like to emphasize to you. Uh, this is uh, uh, the progression free survival. And uh, look at the hazard ratios here. And look at the hazard ratios in patients who have uh, high risk and double hit uh, myeloma. And uh, this is uh, here is the comparison of KRD stem cell transplant KRD versus KCD stem cell transplant KCD. And these are the comparisons of KRD transplant versus KRD into 12. And you can see very significant P values uh, here uh, and also here uh, in favor of KRD transplant KRD. And if you look at high risk uh, fish abnormalities, and then again, uh, patients with deletion 17, uh, deletion 1P, gain 1Q, and 14, uh, the, the hazard ratios as well as the P values are quite encouraging. And the, the uh, emphasis and the shift and the favor is towards KRD transplant KRD except for this one group in which uh, amplification in Q, <coughs> in which there is no benefit of this uh, KRD transplant KRD, uh, this regime does appear to benefit uh, also patients with standard risk, high risk, double hit, and bad cytogenetics. And uh, if you look at MRD, then again, the, the one-year sustained MRD 
uh, is significantly better and is the best with KRD transplant KRD. So now if I were to ask uh, Dr. Amit, so what is your response to these results and what is the implication of these results in your practice? Sir, I think the most important message from these results are that in high risk patient, we have to go for transplant. I mean, we have to convince the patient that it is the treatment. It is no longer a choice or something. It is the way to go because without transplant, things are going to be not that good. So this is probably the most important message. And as we were discussing, as you asked, uh, the hindrance for transplant, I think the initial counseling, the how we are uh, uh, telling the patient that what can be the benefit, and what can be the side effect, it is that that is very important. If we are convincing patient right up front that this is necessary and this is necessary for long term, long term survival, and eventually cost will favor transplant, not against that. And same, uh, as you also mentioned, that uh, same way maintenance also, it is a high risk, definitely a doublet maintenance. This is probably, I would say. So Dr. Ajay, uh, like uh, just, you know, looking at, the, looking at the results of the KRD regime in patients with high risk myeloma, uh, what is your uh, response to this? Uh, and what are the implications of this study and these results? Uh, in your thinking and in your practice. Dr. Ajay, Dr. Ajay Bafna, are you there? So as I said earlier also that the results of the FORTE trial are really encouraging, but uh, do we have the comparison of this trial with the uh, you know standard of care uh, of, with the BRD, which has a long track record and the longest follow-up now BRD is coming to around you know 84 months. And uh, KRD regime, we have nearly 12 or 13, you know, published trial, out of which there is only one phase three trial, that is Forte, and that has also not been published. So I'll take these results with a pinch of salt until unless the manuscripts get published. Till then, VRD is the uh, standard of care, taking into account the risk benefit ratio, cost effectiveness, and the approval by the federal bodies, because this is not so far has been approved either by the FDA or DGCI or by the EMA. So VRD for me remains the standard of care. So very well said, Ajay. I think these results are tantalizing. These results are, you know, they, they provide you some hope. They provide you some indication that this yes, might be the future, but possibly it's a little premature just now to your patient who comes to you tomorrow uh, on on the KRD regime, right? Yes, sir. And uh, secondly, sir, I think uh, this is the time has come that we need to dis you know discuss the high risk group into two groups. Always the ultra high risk need to be discussed very separately, which constitute nearly six percent of all the multiple myeloma. And combining the uh, ultra high risk and high risk, they constitute around fifteen percent. So it's a problem. Of the 6%, we need to discuss it really separately. Very true. The, the, the recommendations for standard treatment should not apply to every single patient with myeloma, right? Yes, sir. So this, again, I think we've already discussed, uh, uh, like uh, the, the uh, effect of uh, the results of the second randomization. Uh, and uh, these were the conclusions of the investigators. Uh, like we are familiar with this, Dr. Parikh and Dr. Ragarwal have discussed this during the, the introduction to this uh, seminar. So, like uh, I think again, we'll. Uh, I'd like to point out to you that this is one full text publication in the Blood in July of this year. Uh, this is a single arm uh, phase two study. Uh, of the IFM group, 10 centers in France, and they have used the same uh, same regime, uh, the KRD regime, uh, uh, four cycles. Uh, number of patients are not very much, about 50 odd patients. Uh, this has been followed by a transplant, and uh, these results are available uh, uh, published in the. Uh, uh, this is, I think, uh, wrongly placed slide. This is the. This is the. Uh, consort diagram of this study which was published in the blood later earlier this year 
uh, 46 patients and you can see the response rates over here uh, very impressive very high response rates uh, and response rates uh, keep increasing as uh, there is more exposure to the uh, krd regime and uh, very impressive uh, crs and vdpr rates uh, and survival curves over here which again uh, are pretty good at uh, medium pfs is uh, 56 uh, months plus uh, so, sir, this study has given the only point in favor of carfilzomib is, uh, you know, less neuropathy, but that can be achieved very well with the subcutaneous weekly bortezomib as well. Yeah, true. So, and this is the adverse effect profile, uh, which has been elaborated in this study. Again, very high uh, rates of grade 3, grade 4 AEs, uh, almost uh, seven, uh, two thirds of the, uh, three fourths of the patients have grade 3, grade 4 AEs. A significant number of patients, uh, they you need dose reductions. So it's an effective regime, the KRD regime, but it is a toxic regime. And the toxicity is much more during the consolidation cycle uh, when there is cumulative toxicity kicking in. Uh, and you know, this is the this is the main study now, the randomized study which we have, uh, which Dr. M. B. Agarwal mentioned, uh, uh, multiple centers uh, led by Dr. Shati Kumar from the Mayo Clinic. The, the endurance study, uh, which was a head-to-head -head comparison of the VRD versus the KRD regime, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and this study had a very large number of patients. I'll just show you the number in a minute. Uh, but the inclusion criteria included excluded patients who had high-risk myeloma, so patients who had 1416 translocation, 1420 translocation and deletion 17 were excluded uh, uh, from inclusion and the one-to-one -one randomization to VRD versus KRD. And uh, this is the concert diagram for you and 500 plus patients in both the arms. So this is one of the largest studies in myeloma and you have the progression free survival over here and the overall survival over here and the curves are pretty much matching. Uh, and uh, uh, here is the forest plot and again you can see that across subgroups uh, uh, there is no difference between KRD versus VRD. And uh, here are the responses for you again not very much uh, different between the two regimes and uh, <clears throat> these were the these were the interpretations of the authors that the KRD regime did not improve PFS, it was more toxic and VRD remains the standard of care for induction uh, therapy for patients with standard and intermediate risk multiple myelomas. And now my question to Dr. Ganesh is, Dr. Ganesh, uh, how do you compare and contrast uh, the Fortnite trial and the endurance trial? Dr. Ganesh, over to you. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, I'm here, sir. So basically as uh, uh, pointed out by you. So endurance trial in the standard and intermediate risk group, the triplet containing bortezomib versus carfilzomib, almost equivocal, whereas uh, here in the fortitile, the carfilzomib remains the essential component of all the three arms. So uh, uh, looking at the, the, the both the trials, sir, our current standard of care with regard to the choice of uh, uh, proteasome inhibitor remains bortezomib unless and until there is uh, very compelling convincing data of carfilzomib based triplet being uh, superior in all, uh, in majority of the you know end points compared to bortezomib based so uh, looking at both the trials uh, our current practice of uh, vrd afferent as an induction across uh, probably will not change excellent so, Dr. Ritu, can I ask you the same question? Uh, like, uh, now when you have these two trials in front of you, the Forte trial results and the endurance trial, uh, endurance trial, 500 plus patients in each arm, then what is your take on this? Uh, say, for example, for the 10 to 15 percent of patients with uh, high risk and very high risk myeloma, would you be tempted to think of uh, switching? Uh, the bortezomib with carfilzomib, Dr. Ritu? Uh, sir, from the endurance trial, one thing is uh, like we get more confidence for standard risk VRD. What we have been practicing seems to be the standard of care. 
And if you compare the Forte trial, yes, for the high risk cytogenetics in the past, uh, we have used carfilzomib based induction. But both the patients were complex cytogenetics, like double or multiple, like it was a complex cytogenetics. They had lambda myeloma with renal involvement. And uh, two, three patients, we have used KRD induction, but unfortunately, one of them relapsed after six months post-transplant, very florid relapse, and two of them after three years or four years. So, but yes, uh, from the Forte trial in a very select group of patient high-risk cytogenetics, I might consider using uh, uh, KRD-based induction. But switching your question, sir, if the patient is not responding, then I might consider switching. But if the patient has been on VRD and responding well, then I may not consider switching. Thank you, Ritu. Can I ask Dr. Agarwal a question? Uh, Dr. Agarwal, are you using uh, MRD uh, routinely in the treatment of your patients of myeloma? And are you changing your treatment vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the MRD reports? Okay, Hemant, thank you. Okay. I'm going to take one minute before I come to answer this question of yours. Uh, I have a feeling that today we got a little skewed in the discussion. And that skewing was probably because the title that we had, Bortezomib versus Carfilzomib, as a part of this whole uh, webinar. Nowhere in this trial, the authors or the researchers have ever talked about Bortezomib because they haven't looked at it. They've only talked about three outcomes. One, I made superior to alkylating agents in induction and consolidation. Two, transplant superior to non-transplant if the patient is transplant eligible. And three, carfilzomib-based treatment followed by double agent maintenance in high risk being superior. That's all. They have at no stage said anything about well care. Now, if you go to, you don't like to do cross trial comparison. But if you go to, why is high risk called high risk? Because we already failed. If you look at, I mean, numbers of trials which have been published, the results of high risk have been poor with VRD induction, transplantation, VRD consolidation, and so on. And that was the genesis of even the quadruplet which came up, that you'd add DARA to VRD and now you've got large number of trials of four drugs. So this got a little vitiated today, I would say last one and a half hour. This trial has not was not meant at any time to compare Bortezomib with Carpilzomib. So that was one part. Now coming to MRD, yes, MRD is becoming the standard of care, uh, whether you like it or not, depending upon the facilities you have. The only facility you have is flow cytometry. And that is available at least in major cities like Mumbai, Delhi, et cetera. So, and interestingly, you do not have to have the baseline flow available to you for MRD assessment. So even if a patient has been diagnosed at third place and if it comes later on to you, you can still assess the MRD. And uh, there is absolutely no reason why you should not, especially in a patient who is uh, high risk, do not look at the MRD. Because if your MRD is positive, you are able to escalate the treatment. So in a given patient, yes, I have started doing MRD by flow at two points. One is before the maintenance and then every six months during the maintenance. Thank you very much. Sir. Those, are, those are words of wisdom. So this was a viewpoint uh, on the endurance trial. Uh, and uh, you know these authors made these comments uh, First comment was the trial did not include patients of high risk, uh, and uh, the trial only about a quarter of the patients underwent subsequent transplantation, uh, and there was notable difference in the toxicity profile of both the regime. So this was an important point of the toxicity with BRD uh, in their analysis uh, and in the. Endurance trial was more with VRD, little less with KRD, uh, primarily peripheral neuropathy with the bortezomib, we are well aware of that, and uh, cardiotoxicity with carfilzomib. And 
we also pointed out that the efficacy uh, in both the arms uh, uh, was a uh, was a little less in the endurance trial as compared to previous published data. I don't know. I think li I kind of like their conclusion that both regimes are equally effective for newly diagnosed myelomas. Uh, patients with risk factors or the presence of peripheral neuropathy should be considered for KRD, whereas patients with cardiopulmonary risk factors or standard risk disease should be considered for BRD. And of course, patient convenience, costs, regional preferences uh, should be used, should be uh, paramount in deciding which induction regime you should choose for. Hemant, again, I want to get in. Can you bring the previous slide up? Yes, sir. <laughs> I think this top part of criticism was unwarranted. Uh, this is bad on the part of these researchers, uh, these uh, reviewers. This study, the endurance study, clearly stated that they have not included patients of high-risk myeloma. Yes, so sir. obviously, this cannot be there. And secondly, they have only worked on patients who were transplant ineligible, essentially, or who declined transplant. So the question of transplant doesn't come there at all. So there the goal of the authors was only to tell you that carfilzomib is superior or not to boltezomib in a transplant ineligible standard risk patients. So this part of criticism by Hamza, Hashmi and all is was not warranted. So this is just a response to this. So this is not essentially a criticism. So. So like uh, 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 last question to the panel, uh, on the basis of the Forte trial, uh, uh, would you think of uh, the KRD combination? Quick short answer, uh, start with Dr. Bausai. Uh, would you think of KRD in your highest patient? No, sir. No, sir. I think uh, that's my take on this. Only patient where I can't use uh, bortezomib, um, it's very rarely neuropathy. That's the only place I'm going to think of using it, sir. And uh, I think uh, sort of the bortezomy versus carfilzomib comparison. So we saw it from endurance and we also have data in ineligible setting from Clarion trial, VMP versus KMP. So it doesn't uh, really give you advantage in terms of PFS. And second thing which we didn't discuss was the toxicities, hypertension, cardiovascular toxicity, rare incidence of TTP. All these are kind of side effect which I, I'm still worried. And if you have equivalent outcome, I will reserve that for relapse. Dr. Amit, you are talking about standard risk, right? Uh, yes, sir. And standard, sir, even for high risk, uh, means we have we can use this forte regimen, give it. Uh, but uh, in that setting also, sir, carfilzomib versus bortezomib data, I think we need to see more data, sir. So, sir, that is an important thing. So, I would like to have your uh, approach to high risk patients, sir. So, how will you, uh, what would be your take, sir? It's very simple. If you can afford DARA, then it is DARA based. If you cannot afford DARA, which is 90% of my patients, it is carfilzomib based, IMID, dexamethasone. So quadruplet versus triplet, DARA affordability versus carfilzomib. I'm terribly disappointed by the results of VRD in patients who are high risk. Median survival is so poor that you will like to do. I mean, otherwise you need not do fish at all. If you're just going to treat with BRD, all your patients, why do pitch at all? Dr. Amit, your, your answer to this question? So yes, sir, on the basis of this trial, definitely the threshold of using KRD upfront in high risk is definitely now lower down. And definitely we will consider that provided he's not having any contraindication or something like that, that prohibits its use or like, because the results are definitely there. Dr. Ajay? And I would say that each part is important. It's not just KRD induction, followed by transplantation, followed by KRD force, yes, followed yes. by double drug maintenance. Yes. So one should not, you know, I mean, tell me one person over here out of the uh, panel or anybody in India who has done this, four cycles KRD, transplant, ORD, four cycles KRD, and then uh, uh, carfilzomib with the uh, land maintenance. Tell me one, two, three, four patients that you have in this group. So do we really have a right to criticize this? No, we are not criticizing, sir. We are just taking an opinion from, uh, from uh, um, um, uh, should we say, high volume myeloma practitioners, sir. We are not criticizing, sir. We are just discussing a scientific trial, the pros and cons of those trials. Dr. Ajay? 
हाँ सर एक्चुअली आई विल फॉलो द इंटरनेशनल गाइडलाइंस इहा एंड द एनसीसीएन व्हिच यू नो बोथ ऑफ देम हैव रिकमेंडेड कैटेगरी वन रिकमेंडेशन टू वीआरडी सो आई विल वेट फॉर द यू नो केआरडी टू यूज इवन इन हाई रिस्क पेशेंट टिल वी हैव द रिजल्ट्स ऑफ एडवांस ट्रायल व्हिच कम यू नो व्हिच कंपेयर्स द डारा वीआरडी वर्सेस वीआरडी और केआरडी वर्सेस डारा केआरडी so i'll follow the international guidelines and we'll follow the whatever the category one recommendation from the top bodies dr ganesh quick answer sir i do echo uh, dr bhau sahab and dr ajay sir my uh, newly diagnosed myeloma patients uh, the induction will be vrd uh, and i'm not yet convinced about uh, the krd across all the uh, high risk subset Thank you, if the patient is going to go for transplant consolidation yes absolutely dr ritu sir can't... i will go for upfront krd in high risk cytogenetics if cost is not an issue and patient is fit i because these are very poor risk groups so even after transplant they are going to relapse and it's a very bad florid relapse i would definitely in high risk select group of patient would like to offer patients instead of vrd This is what Dr. Rajesh has been talking about. This is the ESMO EHA guidelines for myeloma published in February 2021. And yes, sir. Yeah, I was mentioning that. Means VRD and DARA VTD, as uh, Dr. Agarwal has been pointing out. And these are the ESMO guidelines. Category one recommendation is for VRD. Uh, and of course, this regime, uh, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. Is in the other recommended regime, so it certainly figures in the guidelines, but uh, not in the category one guidelines. So you have, you know, you know, full liberty to choose this regime also if you follow the NCCN guidelines. And just a snapshot of the cost of the therapy, just for you know to, add, uh, to get everybody on board. Uh, so if it, this was a 1.5 uh, BSA uh, person patient. A one month therapy. This is only the proteasome inhibitor. About eleven thousand for proteasome and about fifty thousand for carcin carcinogen. So, like this is uh, uh, my take. Uh, essentially, my take. Uh, you might differ with this. This is my last slide. Uh, the results of this study are still not published. We are very anxiously waiting for the full publication so that we can do know all the pros and cons. It is that the combination is expensive and potentially toxic. You have to be especially careful about uh, cardiotoxicities. And again, as been been mentioned by so many panelists, uh, there is no head-to-head -head comparison. Other than the endurance trial uh, uh, with the VRD regime, particularly the high-risk myeloma patients, and uh, it can be considered, as Dr. Agarwal has pointed out again and again, it is also very impressive in high-risk uh, poor prognostic uh, patients um, and uh, in patients who cannot use in in which you cannot use bortezomib because of either existing peripheral neuropathy or high risk of uh, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, this might be the regime to consider, particularly if a patient has high risk disease. And uh, as of date, for the majority of the patients, uh, the standard of care remains the VRD, unless it is contraindicated. With that, I'd like to very profusely thank my panel, very profusely thank Dr. Agarwal for his expert insights, and thank the organizers, Dr. Parikh and Dr. Amish, uh, for this opportunity. Thank you very much. uh thank you sir before uh, uh, dr parik sir uh, takes over for the next uh, expert uh, heman malhotra sir i just wanted to ask uh, dr mb agarwal one question if you allow me to uh, dr mb agarwal sir uh, sir uh, dr parik sir and myself we are learning as this webinar series goes on and okay. one of the thing what you mentioned that uh, the discussion was skewed because of the title of the webinar Uh, the whole idea of keeping this title because as you heard sir last one and half years one and half hours that vrd is the standard right now and you are absolutely right also that in double hit especially double hit high risk cytogenetic we don't have an answer right now vrd fails so going forward what would you advise that you know what would have been the title where we would have had a more fruitful discussion sir and so the second theoretical question is if if uh, after krd 
uh, induction, transplant, consolidation during maintenance, if MRD is negative, should we go for double or should we go for only LEN? So these are the two questions, sir. Sorry to ask you that question, sir. Uh, my pleasure. <clears throat> See, when we are discussing Forte trial as the trial in this whole webinar, right, sir. then this trial is one of the largest and the longest trial started seven years ago, 500 plus patients, three arms. These three arms don't talk about Bortezomib at all. Right, sir. <clears throat> it began in Europe. It's an Italian trial. It began in Europe at a time where lenalidomide was not upfront approved. Okay. So their yeah. first goal was to show that lenalidomide is the standard of care as a combination with PI as against alkylating agents. Right. I know that half of the hematologists in this country are using cyborg D as the induction therapy. Now that this trial clearly tells you that why cyborg D is inferior to a VRD right. and how use of alkylating agents up front can lead to resistance, mutations, and jeopardize the life of a standard risk standard risk myeloma patient. So that is the first most important part which got published two, three years ago, which got presented two, three years ago, right? The second part is this dilly-dally about autologous transplant. So they answered that question, that even if you have a superior PI, even if we have lenalidomide, transplant and not transplant in a transplant eligible patient, transplant is important. Right. That is the second thing it answers. And the third thing that it answered in the ASH20, in the ASCO2021, is about the high risk patients. Correct. You have various ways to look at the high risk patients. One thing is sure that the existing treatment terribly fails with a median survival of just 18 to 24 months. That is the outcome of uh, high risk myeloma patients. Uh, I'm putting everything, whatever may be the reason of high risk. So they are looking at only one aspect, the genetically defined high-risk patients, and giving you at least one aspect, that in these subgroups, except for where there is amplification of 1Q, all other high-risk patients, you have achieved an MRD, which is fantastic. You have maintained that MRD for one year, which is fantastic. And these can reflect into four-year progression-free survival, which, I mean, if you are true to your heart, Tell me how many of your patients have had. Correct, sir. And why are you doing fish studies? I don't understand. Just to give money to med genome and core? <laughs> or are you ultimately fine-tuning your treatment? And if you're not fine-tuning your treatment, then it's just one extra paper in the file of the patient. So what has been brought out by this seven-year study of 500 patients by a large number of Italian groups has to be discussed. Rather than saying endurance study Oh, endurance study for is a non-transplant eligible patient, standard risk myeloma patient telling you that tarpizomib is equal and not superior to Velcade and more toxic. So you should do fish study to dissect out this high risk group and then, then do something for that high risk group patients. And then you say endurance, 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 where is endurance for the high risk? Where is the endurance for the transplant eligible patient? So it's extremely important that when you are discussing over here, you spend some time, read the article, read the presentation, read the publication on that particular trial. We are discussing just one trial. Thank you. Thank you. So read that properly and then come and discuss. You are giving a message to what? About 70, 80 people who have uh, logged in that VRD, VRD, VRD for everybody. If VRD, VRD for everybody, then why from last 10 years we are talking about high risk, high risk, high risk, Daratumumab upfront, quadruplet upfront, carbizomib upfront, tandem transplant, double maintenance. Why are we talking about all this? So you, you are absolutely right, sir. And thank you so much for sharing your insights. But let me tell you, sir, while discussing in the group and publishing about this webinar, the on the WhatsApp group also discussion was going more towards endurance rather than more towards forte. But you are absolutely right, sir. You know, in fact, you will hear medical oncologist and hematologist saying, 
कहा यार कौन सा के आर डी सुपीरियर एंड्योरेंस हजार पेशेंट का स्टडी ने दिखाया है सो पीपल डोंट वॉन्ट टू गो इन टू दिटेल्स एंड दिस वेबिनार एंड दैट्स वाई वी आर लर्निंग फ्रॉम यू ऑल्सो सो एट्स ऑफ टू यू टू टू ब्रिंग दिस अप and i thought it is my duty because the way the discussion was going on bortezomib versus carfilzomib which was not a part of this trial at all absolutely right <laughs> at all right sir right sir sir thank you so much my sir last question when you answer and then over to parik sir sir if the uh, krd induction autologous stem cell krd consolidation the time for maintenance and if mrd is negative uh, would you continue with kr or only r sir स्पेशली इन एल्डरली I at least I get afraid to even talk about carfil zomib. So one there is no pulmonary toxicity. I'm afraid. It is cardiac toxicity. Right. Okay. And it is a manageable toxicity if you screen your patient upfront very carefully. Okay. You cannot write off carfil zomib by saying cardiac toxic, cardiac toxic. Can't use it. Yeah, absolutely right, sir. Huge number of huge number of patients in India have no cardiac problem. Correct. They got their myeloma. They are forties, they are fifties, they are sixties with solid heart. Nothing right. happens to them. Little blood pressure goes up. You monitor the blood pressure. It is not that every second and third and the fourth patient are getting cardiac toxicity. Right, sir. You are using ibrutinib. Causes <clears throat> atrial fibrillation. Right. It is used like water. <laughs> you have to only know the toxicity. Try to carefully do it. You don't want somebody to die of cardiac toxicity or bleed. But in a subgroup of patient where you need something superior, whether it is Dara, whether it is Carfil, whether it even combination, five years from hence you will have probably talking about four drug combination for all high risk patients. Carfil Zomib is not the end of the day. It will be probably Dara, Carfil Zomib, and alkylating agent together with IMID and steroid, because high risk is high risk. And this tip, sir. This double hit patient, this triple hit patient, this. Uh, plasma cell leukemia this extra medullary myeloma uh, the, the cns diseases and all this cytogenetic poor type they do badly so if it's my brother who has got a high risk disease i'm going to treat him with what our best is available today thank you so much sir dr ritu you wanted to say something yes sir uh, i i i agree with sir like high risk is high risk amish if we have to you know compare it with the high risk all or aml we need to hit hard these patients will come back with extra medullary disease and it's a horrible end we all have experienced you know in these high risk group of patients so we now we have a drug okay we can dissect out that it is not published it is not compared with the standard arm but these are the real patients who need real help now we know that standard risk autologous yes we have a ofs overall survival advantage the french ifm group have published their data so standard risk we are all good you know we are all like we know what to do but it is the high risk patients who really need help and when they relapse it's a very bad nothing works so i also would uh, try to offer a more aggressive therapy up front and we have fine we do not have published data all those things we can dissect it out but if you see a high risk patient affordability is not an issue i would i def, I, i have also used also up front it's not that two or three patients up front have used and after two years of bmt they both have relapsed So high risk is a bad disease. And if by specifics and CAR T will move forward, it will yes, be at least twenty percent of patients. Sir, I feel high risk myeloma is a different group of patients, and we cannot apply a standard therapy for the high risk group patients. Ritu, you are absolutely right. The idea of discussing one paper at a time is this only. But at the same time, Ritu, we don't live in silos also. on one side forte is published on other side endurance is published on third time ibm nine year follow up data is published <clears throat> tendum transplant is there so you know to keep the all the loops together and that's it one by one one by dissect and let the audience finally take a final call on their each individual patient <clears throat> but nobody disagrees with you ritu that uh, high risk cytogenetics is uh, difficult to treat and is an unmet medical need today
So now we have a drug, we have a trial, we have a follow up. And Amish in the third arm, if you see where they have not offered transplant, the results are very impressive in the high risk group. I would say that. You know? I agree. Uh -huh. Absolutely. If you if you listen to the video put up by Dr. Fonseca from Mayo Clinic. Yes, sir. I mean, Ritu has heard that. So it's a beautiful discussion that even in the arm not having transplant, this, this combination gave you results. So I'm impressed with that, Amish, that even in the high risk group, if you are not transplanted, the drug is effective, you know. So okay. I am very impressed, provided, you know, we get a hang of using the drug, the toxicities, all those things will come. Initially, with bortezomab also, we were scared. Now everybody uses subcute, we know how to manage the peripheral neuropathy. So it's just a matter of experience. But high-risk group is high-risk group. Like you, like you, I am sold out that on a high-risk myeloma, we are going to talk about KRD, but you know we have to discuss in a group, and this is very important discussion. I think uh, I will hand over to Parik sir now, sir, for the next yeah. step. Thank you. So let me add one more perspective to the discussion, especially the last part. And people were saying that uh, since there is insufficient data, I do not want to use it uh, right now. So recently in United States, there was a court case a patient wanted a particular form of treatment and the doctor refused to give it. And the reason for refusal was that CDC has got a warning against the use of that drug. Finally, the court said, no, doctor, you will have to use this drug. This is my order. Mm -hmm. So now we are going to face one more problem of uh, judges contradicting the medical profession and deciding how we have to treat our patients. So I've just brought that up because this has just come out a few days ago from United States. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hemant Malhotra. You've done a fantastic job of moderating the discussion. Thank you very much for all the panelists, especially Dr. M.B. Agarwal and Ritu on one side and the rest of the team of Ajay Bafna and Bhav Sahib and Amit Upadhyay, everybody else on the other side. Now we have to listen to the third giant in multiple myeloma. And Ahmed Malhotra has clearly stated that this is our representative on the international myeloma platform. So it is our, my privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Pankaj Malhotra, the third giant in today's uh, oncology beyond the obvious, who's from uh, PGI. And over to you, Pankaj. Uh, we have put two questions here for you to uh, discuss, but of course, you are at liberty to discuss more as, as you feel fit. So over to you, Dr. Pankaj. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, first of all, you know, I am just spellbound by the, you know, discussion which we are having for the last one and a half hours. And, uh, you know, uh, and thank you so much for involving me in this uh, discussion. So, you know, uh, when you send me this uh, seminar, so I made, uh, you know, a few points. So I thought, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say these points uh, uh, as one of the, um, you know, uh, panel or member of this. I don't consider myself an expert, but as, as a, you know, panel, I, I would say. But then Dr. M.B. Agarwal and you actually in the interview discuss almost all the points. But still, you know, I have few points and I thought, okay, you know, I, I'll discuss these points then. Then Dr. Hemant Malhotra actually discussed all those points. So, you know, then I was left probably, you know, one or two points. And uh, I 110% agree with the Dr. Agarwal that the, the, the discussion was getting skewed. But he then brought out that point and I, I think I agree 100% with Dr. M.B. Agarwal that if we are discussing 40 trial, it is not a comparison with bortezomib. So, you know, one expert question which you asked, you know, whether you change from boti to carfilzomib, I don't think so, that this is a comparison with bortezomib. This is a car, this is a, you know, Dr. M.B. Agarwal excellently said three points that alkylator is inferior, transplant is required in, uh, uh, you know, these patients and double maintenance. So, this, these three points are from the 40 trial. 
the second thing is i would like to thank uh, you know all the people uh, including dr bhausa for giving me the voting and uh, uh, you know getting uh, elected on the board of directors looking after asia and australia region in the international myeloma society so hopefully next week is the imw workshop so today actually i had gone for getting my visa let's hope if i get the visa so i would be attending the conference next week and then i can share some of those things now coming back to you know one or two points uh, 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 you know uh, about high risk myeloma if we are discussing on standard risk you know you give any triple therapy whatever therapy you want to give uh, you know you are well with that whatever therapy you want to give but if you want to cure standard risk myeloma with the only possibility of cure is there in that particular subset you can use you know four drug combination in them uh, including daratumumab and you know when dr agarwal started with the webinar he was in uh, casual uh, you know close and at the end of the you know webinar he put his coat if you have noticed uh, him <laughs> so i i uh, sir uh, uh, dr agarwal sir i feel that you know these days with so many medicines which are available i feel that in standard risk i would like to give the maximum chance of giving him a cure like in lymphoma patient diffuse large b cell lymphoma we know 50% are cured but at least in standard risk if we can cure somebody who is young 34 years 40 years 45 years uh, there you know i would like to give him the maximum chance of cure by using uh, you know uh, antibody combination with either vrd or uh, you know krd kind of a combination but in high risk myeloma let me tell you i i don't get sleep i get, i become anxious when i see myeloma patient uh, high risk myeloma patients and uh, uh, sorry dr ajay bapna i don't follow any rules in treatment of uh, these high risk myeloma i don't follow the guidelines when i'm treating high risk myeloma whatever best which i can i have with me i would like to use those drugs in high risk myeloma because they are going to give the 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 first chance would be the best chance in these patients so so you give Uh, four drug induction therapy to them or three drug induction therapy to them do a transplant even a tandem transplant and two drug maintenance in them and uh, generally you know we do an mrd uh, every yearly in these patients and continue the double uh, maintenance therapy in them a little uh, extra point that we don't look at only at the bone marrow mrd we also do a pet ct scan because we want this patient to be image negative also not only the bone marrow negativity but we also want them to be image negative also and generally in high risk patients we continue with maintenance therapy we don't stop at uh, you know 2 years even if they are mrd negative high risk patients if you if you you know if you can achieve mrd negativity and consistent mrd negativity for more than 3 years you have done your job so these are you know few of my my comments there are some uh, minor other comments also besides the uh, uh, high risk that generally dilidomide is the standard maintenance therapy in almost all group of patient except maybe you know 414 who are little more you know sensitive to uh, proteasome inhibitor than dilidomide so you know these are 3 to 4% of population so if i have that person there i use bortezomib as maintenance therapy instead of uh, linalidomide one of the question which was asked was the transplant uh, you know patients don't go for transplant and one of the reason actually is you know in standard risk once they become all right the these patients you know always feel or, or even the you know person the physician who is treating these patients they feel you know somebody has achieved a remission now why do we need a transplant so in standard is that's why you know many of the oncologists or hematologists who are treating myeloma patients they don't send these patient for transplant although i feel this transplant actually gives a very good uh, deeper remission in these patients and we maintain this uh, remission for for a long period of time and as i said previously that you know a small subset of patients can be cured i am a strong believer of that that if there is a chance we should try to cure these patients because once the patient relapses he is a high risk he is a high risk patient when the patient relapses uh i think these were some of uh, uh, my comments most of the as i said most of the comments have already been discussed and i agree with the dr mb agarwal whatever he has said i think he has summarized in the beginning 
and in the end all the questions you know uh, excellently so so thank you so much sir i i really enjoyed and i'm spellbound with all the discussion which we had thank you great thank you very much dr pankaj for the exceeding excellent insights in the concluding remarks uh, while I, yes dr agarwal please before you conclude i just want to make one statement which the students can carry home because of pankaj's discussion it reminded me and the question that was put to me about mrd from himant malhotra and amish vora if a standard risk myeloma remains mrd positive he does worse than a ultra high risk myeloma who becomes mrd negative this sentence must not be forgotten by all the students who are listening thank you wonderful i think that's excellently important and before we sign off i remember vijay merchant who had a, a radio show on cricket and after each episode you would say uh, i am signing off but not before reminding you of our next program so our next program is on tuesday 14th of uh, uh, september at 7 pm and it's on checkmate 577 trial which is on adjuvant nivolumab in esophageal cancer that also promises to be another blockbuster and we hope that all of you will join us for the same with that i once more thank all the esteemed faculty uh, not only the three giants but also all the panelists who did such a fantastic job thank you stay safe and good night